from the uh, eBay Search Backend. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to join today's uh, tonight's uh, meetup. So for tonight's meetup, we'll have two great speakers. Uh, one is, uh, the first one is uh, Liron, uh, co-founder and CTO of uh, QuickSafe. And the second one is uh, Jody uh, from uh, Inventor, founder and uh, uh, CEO. Uh, so let's wait a little bit for the first speaker, then uh, we'll get started. And take this time, I want to say that I'm also the speaker organizer for this meetup series. So if you guys have any speaker uh, you want to recommend, uh, just uh, forward that person's uh, kind of information to me. So we're very welcome uh, to basically incorporate into the meetup series. Uh, so as a, a normal practice that I think it's the time anyone want to make any announcement before the formal program start, uh, please do so. Anyone? Okay. Yeah, so let's wait a little bit, then we will start. So this is my first time at the Bay Area Search Meetup. Um, I think Stoney invited me. Stoney, you here? <coughs> hey, so, so thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Liran Shapira. I'm co-founder and CTO of Quixi. Uh, let me bust out this slide here. So, co-founder and CTO of Quixi. Quixi is the search engine for apps. Uh, how many of you guys have heard of Quixi? <coughs> okay. Huh. Maybe a third or half. Cool. So, Quixi was started uh, three and a half years ago by uh, just myself and my co-founder, Tomer. And uh, in all honesty, we didn't have a search background back then. So, I've been in the search industry three and a half years for as long as we've been doing Quixi. Uh, three and a half years ago, we said, hey, let's help people find apps. Let's make a search product where you type in what you want to do and you get a list of apps that do it. Because there's so many apps out there, it seems like they have the potential to make everybody's life better, but there's a very primitive search going on in today's app stores. That's why we started Quixi. So today I'm going to tell you about Quixi search, which we call functional search. Functional search is search that takes a query describing what you want to do, or a function, and then matches with the apps that can do that function. So I'm going to tell you about functional search, what it is, how it works, and what I think is the future of functional search. So here's an example of functional search. If you go to quixie.com today and you type nearby restaurant, you can see the list of results we bring up. You've got uh, Urban Spoon, Open Table, uh, you've got TripAdvisor, Yelp, uh, and it's, it took us a lot of work to, to match that description of what you want to do, to match nearby restaurant to apps like you know, Urban Spoon and Yelp that can get you nearby restaurants. And you can see I've put up here for comparison, you know, kind of tuning our own horn, this is the Google Play Store. This is the most common place where people, at least in the US, where people search for Android apps. And you can see we've got a head-to-head -head comparison where the Google Play Store is really not giving you functional search today. If you type nearby restaurants in the Google Play Store, you're really not going to get these Android apps that can help you find nearby restaurants. So the whole idea of Quixi is if you have the right search technology that can understand what you're trying to do, and you can get the right apps, then you can actually use this extremely powerful device that you've got in your pocket to find nearby restaurants. You, know, you can actually cast this magic spell with your magic wand. That's how I think about it. 
<clears throat> right? Here's another funnier example. When in a movie to pee. You guys, I don't know if you guys know this, there's actually an app that does this. There's an app called Run Pee, and what it does is it tells you when in a movie you should pee. Then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually extremely useful. And then while you're in the bathroom, right, maybe you're missing a scene, so when you come back, it shows you on the screen what you missed. Oh, yeah. yeah, incredibly useful app. So we have a search technology that when you type one movie uh, to pee, if you're ever in a movie and you think to do that, then it, we come back with run pee. And the whole idea is your phone is so powerful, right? Your phone is getting more powerful every day, that we thought we should make a product where you can essentially say wishes into your phone and get apps that, that solve it. Uh, and again, you know, they're okay, not really getting it. Their first result is Skype. One more example, control my laptop, right? So we have a bunch of remote control apps that you can use to use your phone as a remote control and, uh, you know, as opposed to color note, notepad, cell phone tracker. So, so that's the product. This talk is going to be about the, the search ecology behind this product that I've shown you now. Uh, one more quick note about Quixi, though. Uh, we're not really a destination site, so you can go to Quixi.com to check us out. But what we really do is we power search. So, this app ranking technology that you're seeing here is typically accessed in the form of a Quixi API, and the actual front end for this is our distribution partners like Ask.com, Sprint, and a number of others that haven't been announced yet. <coughs> so yeah, that's, that's, that's what this is showing here. So powered by Quixi, that's what we do, we powered search. If you guys remember uh, around 2000, if you go to Yahoo and do a search, you'd see powered by Google. So before Google is famous as a destination site, they power Yahoo. So that's kind of our game here. We power various search solutions. Uh, one important fact about the search that we built at Quixi is that it's all platform. So when you think about an app search, you know, I showed you examples with Android, and I showed you head-to-head compa head -head comparisons with Google Play. When you think about an app search, it's, it actually doesn't have to be platform specific. <laughs> So we've got Android, <coughs> Xbox, iPhone, we've got web-based platforms for apps, like Facebook uh, has apps, Salesforce have apps. I mean, what you see here is even you know, apps that have apps is the current state of the ecosystem today. So we're an all-platform search solution, and I'm going to show you what that means in terms of our data model. Uh, so real quick, we, we get data from a lot of different sources. So most app search engines make a really limiting assumption. They make the assumption that if you want to search for apps, you go to an app store, and then you just treat everything in the app store as a bunch of documents. So you basically have document search, except the text of the document comes from maybe the description of an app in the Android market, something like that. That's a very naive approach to app search, just a very trivial, naive mapping between app search and, and document search. And we realized, wait a minute, if you're trying to find an app to control your computer, to do anything, it's really not enough to try to keyword match you know, to treat the app store document as if it's a document and that's what you're searching. That's just not a realistic worldview. I mean, if you want to figure out whether an app can do what you want, there's all kinds of sources of metadata. For example, there's the app's website, right? There's social media sites, there's blogs, there's third-party editorial reviews. All of this content, if you're just using common sense, it's obvious that all of this content on the open web is relevant to whether an app can do what you want. So. When we built a search whose goal was to find apps that do what you want, we really thought about where is this data that any human with common sense would go and grab if they wanted to find whether apps were relevant. So you can see we've got uh, reviews, social media, blogs, security, usability, cross-platform. The way we thought about it was, if my friend came up to me and he said, hey, Liron, can you help me find an app that controls my computer? I'd be like, sure, let me go do some research for you. Let me see what the blogs are saying. Let me see what Twitter people are saying. Uh, you know, let me, let me look up this developer, right? What are this developer's other apps? Does this look like a credible developer? Do I want to recommend one of this developer's apps to you? Uh, what is the buzz about this app? Has it been trending? Is it getting used more and more? Or is, or is the trend going down? I would collect every signal that I can as your friend before I make a recommendation to you. So we wanted Quixi to just automate that process. And that got us to this data model, which we call apps as first order objects. So you can see the one thing in the middle of our data model is just the app. And it's a more abstract concept of an app that you'll see in any app store. So I showed you a head-to-head -head comparison of Google Play. If you're an app store, you see basically the tip of the iceberg. What you see is maybe this node here, the addition. An addition is a specific instance of an app in a specific store tailored for a specific platform. So think about an app like Yelp. 
right? Yelp is one of the main apps, one of the main serious apps that has lots of additions. You can get a Yelp, you can get a Yelp native app on your Android phone, Yelp native app on your iPhone, there's Yelp.com the website, there's a mobile optimized Yelp website. Yelp is everywhere. And we realize that we we be define common sense unless we put a node in the middle of our data model that whose significance was just Yelp. Yelp the product. Yelp the product is what the developer wants to transmit to the user. So it's essential that this was the center of our data model, was developers making apps that users use. And then secondary to that is the idea of, oh, there's platforms, there's specific additions that run on the platform, there's devices that run the platform as an operating system or, or you know, a virtual machine or something like that. Um, and it's also secondary that you've got metadata and you've got structured fields like security rankings, star reviews, popularity, downloads. You've got those, and it's actually worth attaching those to the app. It's worth cross-referencing those across different platforms. If an app is trending on iOS, that actually has some meaning for somebody searching for the same app on Android. When we started this in 2009, we were the only company that had a data model that looked anything like this. Everyone else was trapped in the platform-centric world because if every platform were a different island and the apps on that platform really were just for that platform. When, if you just take an, a common sense perspective, both an economic perspective and a user value perspective, it's actually pretty obvious, especially in retrospect, right, that developers just want to make apps that users use and all this technology stuff is a secondary consideration. So we use a machine learn regression search. So for a lot of you, I think that's going to mean a lot, and you're going to be like, oh, I get it, cool. So I'm going to go into some of the details of what we do for our specific machine learn regression search. And I'm also going to start by reviewing what is machine learn regression search in general. So this is what it is in general. You start with a query app pair. So maybe the query is control my computer, and the app is super computer remote control. Great, that's your query app pair. The goal over here on the right is to get that query app pair mapped to a score. So once we have a score, let's say between 0 and 1, let's say we take the query app pair and we get 0.7, great, we can compare it to other query app pairs. And then for the query uh, control my computer, we'll be able to rank all the different apps according to the query app score. So that's the premise of, the, the first premise of, premise of machine learned regression search. Um, and then the second idea is that if I can map the query app pair to a vector of features, maybe 100 features in a vector, feature 1 through 100, then I can make a second mapping that goes from the feature vector to the score, and that'll be a more manageable task than trying to map the query app pair directly to the score. That's the trick of machine learned search, is let's map a bunch of stuff to feature vectors and then go from there to scores. Okay, so there's three steps to get a machine learning regression search. First, you need to define your features. Define how the query app pair is going to get mapped to you know, the 100 features. Then you have to collect your training points. Training points are basically a bunch of hired people who come in and tell us how the query app pair maps to a score, what the target score should be. And then you train a machine learning regression model. So, uh, so you train the computer that can make sense out of the features and what score they should map to. All right, so we have a lot of types of features at Quixi. Uh, the first, they, they fall into three types. The first types are, are query features. So query features is just properties of the query. How many words are in the query? Is it a popular query? How would you classify the query? These are all, you can represent all of these as numbers. Uh, and, they, and they can all be numbers, they can all be one of the 100 numbers in the 100 feature vector. So for category classification, are you, are you, are you using a dictionary-based approach? So for category classification, we keep throwing different ideas at the problem. So it's as simple as, hey, here's 12 buckets uh, that, that we manually wrote, you know, classified into one of those. Or, hey, our new scientist just thought of this other fancy thing, try that. Uh, we're not really tied to one approach for that particular feature. Okay, so result features, aka app features, these are features that only have to do with the result. So how many downloads did it have, and how many stars did it have in this particular store, and uh, 
is the average review positive or negative? So this is a good chance if we just have some fancy uh, sentiment analysis that we want to throw out the problem. The output of that is just going to be a number that plays into our feature vector as an app feature. Number of platforms. This is one that's unique to Quincy's data model, right? Number of platforms. Remember I mentioned uh, our data model was something that really we invented from scratch and it was actually one of the first in, in the whole industry to even do that. So a data model like that lets you define features like number of platforms. The concept that, hey, Angry Birds, did you know that Angry Birds has about 50 different editions and it's on about a dozen different platforms. And that's a pretty good signal that Angry Birds is a very serious app and it's probably good. So number of platforms is a signal that we, that we connect using a lot of cross-referencing. So the review was DVD, right? Does it have any context in it, or is it just a uh, so, generic? Uh, well, the implementation uh, when I when I first saw this get implemented, it, it didn't have additional context. I mean, we already threw a bunch of fancy stuff at it just to uh, you know analyze its positivity. Um, I don't know what the latest what we call our science team. I don't know if their latest build has uh, you know extra secret sauce thrown in. I'm basically telling you about. You know, I'm, I'm telling you about a framework where we can throw lots of fancy stuff into it, and I don't know what the latest fancy stuff even is. So yeah, good question though. So query result features. These are the hardest features to calculate because you can't just calculate them ahead of time because they have to do with the app. You can't cache them as a function of the query. They're a function of both the query and the app. So the most obvious one is TFIDF, uh, which is basically how well does the entire body of text that we've collected in all the app's metadata match the text in the query? And then weighted by uh, uh, terms that are rare and stuff like that, TFIDF. Uh, TFIDF for, for the entire corpus for the app's title. So let's restrict it to the app's title. How good is the TFIDF on that? That's another feature. Category alignment. So maybe you category classify the query, you category classify the app. How well do the category classifications align? There's another feature. And finally, we have some interesting stuff in our own domain. If somebody types the word free, then you know maybe they're looking for an app that's about freedom, but most likely in our domain, they just don't want to pay for their app. And if we notice that an app is free, then we do have you know, some special sauce about our own domain where it's like free. Even if you type under five bucks, we, uh, some of our API calls, some of our API endpoints even recognize that. And, and apply a filter on that. So stuff like that, domain-specific matching is also part of the framework. Okay, no single feature is sufficient. Meaning, sure we have title text match, non-title frequency. Uh, look at the sample query games. It's, when you think about features, we get asked questions like, hey, so this feature, how much does it weight into the result? Like, how, if the app has a lot of downloads, then uh, do you put a lot of weight on that and do you rank it higher? And in a very vague, you know, 30,000 feet view, I can be like, yeah, sure, it helps, you know, as a, as a one-dimensional analysis, sure. But really, you need to look at a combination of features to, to tell whether the, the app is good for the query. It's actually not just a linear combination of them. Let me show you a specific example. In the query of coffee shop, you might think that all things being equal, if an app is more popular, if everything else is equal, or everything else seems equal, and an app is more popular, then it deserves to rank higher. But you can see us versus Google Play again. Google Play thinks a lot of these apps um, are great for coffee maker, but they tend to be really childish and, uh, and not what most people are looking for for the query coffee shop. Whereas we find apps that are more serious, like, hey, maybe this first app that we found, Coffee Shop Finder, it's like, oh, you want to find a coffee shop? That seems like something you probably want to do if you type the query coffee shop. Now, we, we went and researched Coffee Shop Finder in the Android store, and it's about, uh, it has about five reviews total. It's uh, maybe 10% as popular as, as Coffee Maker, but we think it's just a better result. So it's actually important that we didn't weight popularity highly on this one, because we use a combination of factors in tandem. Can I get data about how, how many times that we used after the download? Uh, that would be an amazing feature. So the answer is we're always looking for data like that. We always ask our distribution partners if we can get it, but we only have a small fraction of it. So most searches you see on Quixi really don't have a chance to use that data. But yeah, I mean, that's almost cheating, right? I mean, that's, that's the holy grail of data. Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna talk about meta features. 
Because the way I define the problem, sure, it looks nice in theory, right? You just get 100 features and then you get a, you get a ranking. It looks great in theory, but in practice, it's basically impossible. It's just impossible. It's, I really don't recommend trying it. It's a huge pain. So one way we cheat on the problem is with this concept of a meta feature. We don't want to have 100 features, because if you have 100 features and then you try to score them, there's basically no way you can ever get a sane regression model with a 100-dimensional domain like that. It's just not going to work unless you have, you know, really huge scale, probably orders of magnitude, um, you know, like Google scale, basically. So instead of learning a, a big regression, what we do is we take, we might clump together 10 or so features and we define what we call a meta feature. So that way maybe we'll only have uh, 10 meta features. And then we can do a much smaller regression where we, we use machine learning to learn how these vectors made out of 10 meta features can relate to a score. And we can also do machine learning on these 10 mini problems, right? You, so you get a total of 11 problems. You have 10 problems up here that you can use machine learning to know how features 90 through 100 relate to meta feature, uh, meta feature number 10. Or you can just cheat and define meta feature number 10 as like a hand-tuned linear combination of features 90 through 100. You can do anything. The point is that you factor the problem into meta features and then you don't find yourself with a 100-dimensional <coughs> machine learning problem uh, with a you know, realistic size corpus of data to train it. Can you please operate upon the how you it, it's, it's basically a ranked list, right? That's what you're retrieving. You're decompressing the features, right? So it's not that we're compressing. Let me give you the specific example, and then if, if it doesn't clarify, then ask again. So here's an example of a meta feature we have over here. We just call it quality. Let me see. And an example of a, of a regular feature that we feed into it is number of tweets. So we have a feature called number of tweets. And that would normally combine with 99 other features to get fed into a machine learner. But instead of that, we're like, OK, wait a minute. Take number of tweets, combine it with maybe nine other features, and chunk them all together in a big meta feature called quality. So that when you do the machine learner, you're only doing the machine learning on quality, text relevance, and eight other meta features. So that, that's the idea there. Uh, there's pros and cons to that. So I'm going to do the con first. The con is that it constrains what the machine learner can learn. So you're actually, I mean, you can't get value for free, right? If you're trying to simplify the problem, you do that at the expense of losing some flexibility. In particular, uh, if you guys are familiar with BayesNets, there's this idea of screening off, the concept of screening off. So in this diagram, um, if you want to know the overall score, the overall score is screened off from the number of tweets by the quality. Meaning, like the quality is standing in the way between number of tweets and overall score. What that means is that there can't be a special relationship between number of tweets and text relevance, except for the relationship that's already given by quality and text relevance. So for example, I have an example up here. Um, you can't learn the fact that a high text relevance score is a bad sign for apps that have a lot of tweets. You can't learn that. You can only learn something like a high text relevance score is a bad sign for apps that have a high quality, which might not be accurate anymore. So by factoring the world like this, anytime you factor the world into components, you lose some flexibility. Now if you want to get the flexibility back, all you have to do is selectively unfactor it. So in this diagram, if I drew an arrow here, where I let the number of tweets affect the text relevance, or even if I drew an arrow here, where I let the quality affect the text relevance, then I've stopped the screening off. So I've, I started unfactoring the problem and, and tearing out my optimization because I wanted more flexibility back. So to me, this is a very easy con to accept because it's, it's like I did this myself. You should only factor the problem to the extent that you're willing to lose flexibility because there's no flexibility needed. Right? That's what factoring the problem means. In practice, there really is nothing else that number of tweets can tell me in my experience working on this. There's nothing else that number of tweets can tell me besides how overall good an app is. That's what we think. Okay, so this has some cool pros too. So the pro is we have domain knowledge and now we can factor the problem. So we don't have to pretend like the problem is a bag of 100 features that we can't make sense out of. We can actually say, hey, these 10 features are actually pretty intimately related. There's like some underlying hidden variable called quality that they're all signals of, and you can compute that first and go from there. Right? That's a really awesome factoring of the problem. That factoring of the problem, I feel like everybody intuitively knows that. Right? Everybody intuitively knows that when you want to evaluate an app, there is some sense of like its platonic goodness in your head. 
And it's a shame not to get that out of the head of the engineers, <coughs> get that out of the head of the engineers, so that they can, and simplify the problem for the computer. So that's what we're doing with meta features. Um, yeah, so we've got the quality, the specific quality score meta feature. I talked about how it might take into account number of tweets. It might also take into account uh, store specific star ratings. I mean, it would be ridiculous to have every store specific star rating as a separate meta feature, as if. You know, the iTunes store is so special that it has a relationship to some other random signal. Signal number 98 is related to signal number 3. Uh, it just doesn't happen. It's really easy to chunk a bunch of signals together in many cases. Uh, store specific review counts, number of recent tweets about an app, average popularity of all apps by this developer. That's a fun one because it's, uh, you know, we compute it offline and then we have it as a, as a signal and we dump it into the meta feature. Um, yeah, so we're... Quixi is all about, Quixi search is all about using the best part of the human brain together with the best part of computer's ability, right? Just take the best of each and get the best search as a result, right? It all started when we said, hey, everybody's data model is wrong, I have a better one. Um, and then we said, hey, everybody's data corpus is wrong, right? They're looking data in the wrong places. Let's use our human brain to advise that. And finally, it comes down to, hey, I know how to factor our signals better, better than the computer. Okay, one more pro. Uh, this one might not be so obvious. It's easier to get high quality test data. So I'm gonna talk about how you train a machine learner by you know, using labeled data. Uh, labeling data is kind of tricky. It's hard to ask to pay somebody to come into your office and say, uh, hey, can you tell me how good this app is for this query? You know, they might be like, well, what do you mean by good? I mean, this is Angry Birds, this is an amazing app. And I say, uh, okay, but the query is uh, find a nearby restaurant. Right, so it's hard to just, it's hard to explain to somebody perfectly uh, what, I mean, you can do better than that, but it's hard to explain perfectly what just good means. So now we've got all these precise subscores that we can ask people for. We can ask them, um, how high quality is this app, given that we can show you it has these star ratings and reviews and tweets, right? So we can ask them to train our quality meta feature separately from training the overall scoring function. And then we can ask them, hey, how textually relevant is this app? And we actually do this, by the way, we actually have a system that asks people how textually relevant is this given this selection of text. And we use that to train the meta feature. And then from there, train the overall score. We still ask people about overall score, but now we can get better subscores. We don't have to infer um, all these other concepts from only a single type of training data. We can now have a different type of training data for each meta feature. All right. so. That's the first step in machine learning regression search. You've got to define your features. Collecting training points. It looks like this. So this is a, an actual screenshot from our evaluation system. Um, you know, we can see we don't really optimize for, uh, for beauty. Uh, so we hire full-time paid testers, and we say, here's a query, here's an app, or you know, here's a meta feature in some cases. Um, give me a score from one to five. We get hundreds of these a day uh, per tester. We say, uh, so for example, the query is Temple Run, and here's an app called Temple Run colon Brave. Uh, how good is this? And you can see it says five best, four highly relevant, three acceptable, two poor, one embarrassing. Now, for, so for this one, it's not a five, it's not best, and I'll tell you why. If somebody types Temple Run as their search query, out of all the Temple Runs, chances are they just want Temple Run. And Temple Run colon Brave, is probably a four, like it's a really good result, maybe even number two, it's just not the best. So that's the kind of data that we need out of these testers. Um, that, that's what goes into the machine learning process. Yeah? Can I ask a question here? So you're, there's also debate for collecting training data like this, whether you should crowdsource it or have in-house testers. So that's right. why did you guys decide to do you know, in-house experts versus uh, crowdsourcing? People have written sure. papers and say, no matter how good your in-house people are, if you get five, you know, if you get five random people, you can, you can beat them. Sure. Okay. Well, we we've actually tried a couple things. Um, we haven't tried crowdsourcing, but we have tried something a lesser known technique called team sourcing, uh -huh. where we hired a bunch of teens to come in and do it. Huh? And <laughs> <laughs> so we we've tried a couple things. We try we tried. Uh, um, you know, we played a lot with the system ourselves. I think that the end game, you know, when we have a little more scale, um, you know, we're still in startup mode, right? And the short answer was, when you hire somebody full time and pay them, they tend to really do what you ask, right? And be consistent about it. So 
our experience with teen sourcing is just it's hard to it's hard to just manage these kind of processes. There's so much mess even on the technology side, right? Just on me, just on getting the machine learning stuff to work, and on uh, you know making sure that your data doesn't get corrupted. The last thing you want to do is manage a whole crowd of people uh, when when you have bottlenecks left and right because it's a startup. So that's basically the answer. If you give us another couple of years, you know it would be amazing. You know when we have thousands of employees to have a couple of them lead a crowdsourcing effort. So that's that's the entire answer. <coughs> Okay, so the third step is we uh, is we train a machine learning regression model. Uh, so this is uh, I think a lot of you guys probably know it, and then the other half of you are like, I have no idea what that means. That's my guess about you guys. Um, so the idea is we have we have a bunch of people telling us that if you get a query app pair, then they'll tell us what the score is, right? Like if you get Angry Birds, comma throw birds at pigs, or the other way around, throw birds at pigs, comma Angry Birds. Uh, that's like a 0.99, that's like an amazing match. So we have data like that from our testers, and we also have feature calculations. So if you give me, um, if you give me throw birds at pigs, comma, angry birds, I can also give you 100 features, or 10 meta features, or something like that. Right? So you've got, you've got these two pieces of the puzzle. The third piece of the puzzle is to, is to infer what in general a query app pair, what in general a 100 feature vector means about a score, right? The, the, the hardest part is to say, okay, here's 100 numbers, how do they map to one number between zero and one, right? It seems impossible until you realize, well, I have a bunch of sample points, all the points that I collected, all the query app to score points that I collected, translate into 100 feature to score points. So maybe I can interpolate between these tens of thousands of, of points, and maybe I can calculate some function uh, of this, yeah, I don't know, machine learning, Machine learning in general is kind of hard to explain. <coughs> so what is your ratio between number of features in general and number of data points? Number of features? Ah, no, it was number of data points. So, Zero? Well, <laughs> no, no, no. So we have, um, so actual data points are hard to come by. And like I said, we pay people full time to come and give them to us. There's really no easier way except like, I guess, really clever crowdsourcing one day. Um, so we have, I'll tell you a lot of our secret sauce, like the really secret sauce that doesn't really have elegant description, is trying to make the most we can out of the least training data we can. Like even as a company that has tens of thousands of training points uh, inputted every month or so, something like that is the, is the order at which we get these points. Uh, even doing that, we're always, we never have as specific training points as we'd like. Like when we want to test a new meta feature, you know, it's like, damn, the guys, the testers went home and they're busy testing something else and we only have like 500 training points here, what do we do? So we're always trying to milk our training points and get as much value as we can. And some of our most, uh, some of our most intense search experts who work at Quixie, you know, the whole, the whole magic that they do is they know all the right parameters to tweak to try to get the most learning out of the least possible data. You know, it's a constant struggle. So, so yeah. <laughs> how do you select your training points? Select, uh, you, oh, how do you select, like, which queries to test? Is so, that right? So you select some, uh, you collect some training data. Yeah. Right? And how do you decide which piece of training data to collect in the first place? Is it just random or uh. cluster? Select. So an example would be like how do we know to collect the piece of training data that has that for example takes this query and asks to rate this meta feature, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so we we really just have a bunch of considerations that we take into account. So one consideration is uh, what's our current deliverable. Like for example, every time we, we have a new distribution partner, a lot of times they need uh, you know they have a new focus of data and they care, they actually care about a specific subset of queries and they want to make sure that their own brand is, is uh, you know, not falling in the rankings for no reason. So a lot of times we'll do a focus test that's parameterized by that kind of stuff. But in general, we're, it's basically a really big, uh, almost a sanity check. Like we want to make sure that in all the different domains, all the different categories, we just want to represent everything. And when a science engineer invents a new meta feature, then you know, they get to dump a lot of that into the the testing set for next time. Uh, so my team actually had a, a research release the other day, and then we got our own special testing project for that, and we defined our own points for that. So, yeah, I mean, basically any team can uh, can suggest a bunch of different points, and it'll get tested. It's 
pretty cool. OK. What kind of regression model does Quincy use? OK, I'll, let me explain a little bit about what that question means. So I talked about how if you want to teach a machine to map 100-dimensional feature vectors to points, or maybe 10-dimensional, some high-dimensional feature vectors to uh, score points, if that's your goal, then you really just have to train it somehow based on a bunch of training points. And there's a lot of different outputted relationships that you're going to get, what are called uh, regression models. Uh, so the question is, what regression model do you use? So for example, there's this thing called uh, uh, support vector machine that gives you one type of regression model. The regression model is basically a way to say, nobody can ever really learn this perfectly because there's no right answer. So what kind of mold do you force your answer to fit into? That's the fundamental question of regression models. And the answer, in Quixie's case, is boosted decision tree, gradient boosted decision tree. Uh, so what we output is the form of our 100 dimension to one dimension function always takes the form of a forest of decision trees. Uh, but it's, this is, I mean, I'm starting to just talk about machine learning in general. So that's, I guess it's outside of the scope of this talk. But for the record, we use a really nice commercial grade, very well known package called Salford Systems TreeNet. Uh, it's a boosted decision tree learning package. Uh, we also do a bunch of other ML stuff on the side. So we do ML stuff for query understanding, dynamic app classification, like we talked about, um, cross-platform app addition merging. I mentioned we have this great <coughs> data model that merges the same app across different stores. It turns out that's really hard. So hard we even threw some machine learning at it. And it took years, by the way. Um, yeah, so we did that. Let's see. So. What this gives us is, uh, you know, th all this work is to get that relationship between these cryptic giant vectors of features and the output score that you can rank apps based on. Okay. So there's also the problem of choosing the best model. So these, these machine learners, they output these models. They're like, oh, I got it. You can give me any 100-dimensional feature vector and I'll give you the score for that. You know, and hopefully it makes some sort of sense. Uh, the problem is that when, we, when these models get built through this you know, amazing commercial tree net package that we didn't write, we just use as a black box, when these models get built, a lot of times they're not optimizing for what our real optimization criterion is. Our real optimization criterion, uh, our real optimization criterion is this thing. It's, it's this thing here, it's a metric on query, comma, and then a vector of, of five apps of multi-app rankings. In English, what that means is we want to make a really good search, and we want to make it so that when you type a query, the first five apps are in a really good order compared to like the first, you know, the million choices we had. We picked a really good ordering for the first five, right? That's our true goal for Quixie Search, or at least a much better capturing of our true goal than than what the machine learner trains on. The machine learner trains on something less precise. It trains on query, app, and score points. So it trains on a bunch of examples. It might say like, oh, I nailed the fact that Angry Birds is a really good match for, uh, for throw birds at pigs. I nailed that. It's like, sure, but did you nail the fact that it would have been better to rank it second because there's a more popular version of Angry Birds to rank first? So there's always little gotchas like that because when you do a naive point-by-point -point machine learning training, you're not training according to your true metric. Our true metric is captured by this industry standard thing called DCG, discounted cumulative gain, uh, which is a measure of, of this thing. It's a measure of how good is your top five ranked list of apps compared to all possible top five ranked lists of apps that you could have outputted. Um, so what we end up doing is we just run the machine learner a lot and we tweak the parameters. And you know these search engineers, which are essentially magicians, know how to tweak these parameters and get these you know, superior models. So you can see the, the kind of things they might try are uh, different combinations of features. They might try different tree net settings, like learn rate and max trees. Uh, they might try banging on the keyboard. Yeah. Uh, they, might, they might try actually going back and getting more better data. Or they might go back and say, wait, this doesn't make any sense. Let's go check our training data. Oh, there's actually a systematic error in our training data. Let's fix that. Can you use different priors this, uh, this decision tree? Different priors. What do you mean by prior? Priors. What are your priors? Um, there's certainly parameters, yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, you can, I don't know, represent the data differently. I don't think there's anything like a base. Right, it's what's representing parameters when you don't have data. Oh, okay, sure. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, that sounds like something you can do. I'm not, I gotta tell you, I'm not one of the magicians. I only employ them. <coughs> okay. 
Um, and then, a quick question about the yeah. ranking. So when the when the query comes in <coughs> to run and you run through and do all your query app scores and then display the results, or you run through, take the top end results, and then re-rank them with a more expensive ranking function? Do you do a two-pass ranker? Um, I don't think we do. It's more like we rank it the first time, and sometimes it actually works. And then sometimes when we do the second phase DCG test, uh, this is at a, at a human level, like at a, you know, it's done, let's test it now. And then the test doesn't go well, and it's like, wow, so something went wrong with our whole learning process. This is actually a pretty big cycle. This isn't like really quick back and forth. a lot of larger web search and commerce search, you'll have a cheap ranking function to sort of get you in the neighborhood of the top oh, yeah. 2,000, and then you have a more expensive ranking function. That's right. You know what? I completely forgot. This should totally have, uh, have been part of, the, part of the talk, which is, that's right. So we don't, we don't go and calculate at search time. We don't go and calculate these, these uh, expensive rankings on every single app when you type in a query, right? So we have over a million, well over a million apps in our database, and we, just nobody has that computational power, not even close. So yeah, so what we do is we, we use Lucene. I mean, not regular off-the-shelf Lucene, but we do have a relatively, uh, <coughs> relatively well-known solution where when you type a query, our first goal is to get maybe a few thousand apps worth considering. It's like, okay, forget about, try to forget about the million app corpus, try to whittle it down to maybe a thousand app corpus as fast as you can, <coughs> as cheaply as you can, and only then you should begin starting to calculate the scores for query app pairs once you've really cheaply eliminated 99% of things. Yeah, so that, that's extremely important, yep. Um, we do, we have some special sauce about doing that too. We didn't just, uh, you know, spin up a, a Lucene instance, but, uh, but yeah, I really did focus on our second stage, which is where most of the secret sauce is. Yeah, so, man, great question, yeah. All right, so, kind of transitioning a little, I want to tell you guys, oh yeah, go ahead. So do you have any mechanism of verifying that your model actually is worthwhile for people outside because you're taking a lot of trouble to tweak the thing, right? Right. So how do you have a feedback mechanism? Sure. For me, a nameless Joe, who comes to your website mm -hmm. and looks at it. So do you have any way of verifying that it's actually relevant for me because you're going through, it through another party, right? Right. Which displays your results. Yes, okay, yeah, so a, a couple answers. So we have distribution partners, and they actually do a lot of, in most cases, they have a lot of their own analytics. So first of all, we get basic things like, you know, click rates, maybe sorted by category. So we, we get feedback in the form of analytics from our partners. Uh, we also, our partners also do a lot of their own DCG testing, right? Because we really, we try to follow all the best practices about, you know, running our own internal tests, you know, we don't look at our own training data, we don't use it as testing data, but you need a third party to get really reliable tests. So we have that. At the same time, uh, I would say the feedback cycle is not as complete as we want it to be, just because all our biggest distribution partners were launched in the last maybe four months. So we're actually, uh, you know, Quincy is actually a very young company, so I, I'm not satisfied with the current state of the feedback cycle, and we're just going to keep working to improve it. Today, if you're an average Joe using Quixi and you don't like the results, you basically should just email me personally. <laughs> we're, still, <laughs> we're still small enough for that, yeah. So actually, the problem is when I looked at your website, I really didn't, I mean, I looked at your website, the website, that, the page that you said Node Engineer actually maintains. Yeah. And I actually looked through it. I really didn't have any idea if that was the app I wanted. Sure. So I just typed in, I got something, then I stared at it, and I was like, okay, this, this is my angry words. Right. And, okay, let me just click through it. Then it occurred to me that maybe that's what everybody's doing. They just take the first click, like, you know, with Google search, mm -hmm. the rule of thumb used to be that just click on the very first link and the first two or three are answers, and they know best. So, right. if you actually, so I'm just wondering if you actually randomly generated stuff, uh, and just to show, sh sure, would people still blindly follow it? Or I mean, I'm just wondering, is it, I mean, you're doing a lot of stuff here, but is it the payoff in terms sure. of the uh, nameless Joe trying to get it? So just... Got it, yeah. I mean, so it's basically, we go off one form of DCG or another. I mean, first we do our own. Uh, we have third parties that also feed it back to us, both our, our distribution partners as well as just independent organizations. If you're an average Joe, we don't very directly track your behavior. I mean, the cycle is not, you know, it doesn't feed back that well today. But yeah, I mean, the ultimate measure is, actually, if, if you look at the actual definition of the criterion of what constitutes a good Quixie search, it's all very qualitative and, qualitative and fuzzy, but the way I put it is that the, the best search result is the one that has the highest expected happiness distributed among all the users who typed in that query. 
So that that's the measure we're shooting for, you know, as we try to improve the feedback. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a couple of uh, apps on the App Store. I was trying to look okay. for what query I should use to get my app. I could not get any. <laughs> I was trying, okay. you know. When you are saying that, so I was trying. Yeah, then sure. what you must be doing to find, I mean, I Sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not perfect. I mean, actually, you know, we're proud of what we've come so far, but there's really, if you look at what we're trying to accomplish, what we've done so far is a very small fraction of what we want to do, and we, we know it's not perfect. So, you know, shoot us in with developers actually. No, no, no I just, I, I'm sure, yeah. pretty much I need to change my description so that somehow it comes in your top, you know. Sure, uh, that might help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I was thinking what I should do. I, mean, yeah. I was trying to do you, do you aggregate your data and resell the research back to the app developers? Uh, we, what, we don't do what any of that today. Are using to get to their apps? We don't do any of that today. Uh, we really do, and it's largely, we don't do any of that today just because we've been so focused on getting a great search out everywhere. We actually think that today, in a typical day, uh, millions of people are suffering from <coughs> having bad search experiences at various destinations. Like that's, that's the problem that we're working extremely hard and extremely rapidly uh, to solve. What you mentioned about, yeah, let's sell back to developers this idea of premium. This would be extremely valuable to developers of knowing how to distribute their app better. There's a ton of value in the economy of developers making apps that they want users to use, and you know, targeting that, being the middleman, quite honestly, is incredibly valuable for everybody involved. Uh, we care about developers a lot, and I see Quixi as a company. I see developers as one of the biggest uh, markets for Quixi, one of the biggest you know demographics that we can add value to. Honestly, we have been focusing more on creating value for our users and distribution partners today. But kind of our next act involves developers a lot more. All right, future of, of app search. Um, so just a couple of thoughts on the future of app search because you know today what we do is you type in a query and then we get you apps, right? So okay, you want uh, if you type watch Toy Story, we'll be like okay, you want to watch Toy Story? Netflix, check out Netflix. You might be able to watch Toy Story, and then you have to download Netflix, and then you open Netflix, and what do you do when you open it? Well. You have to go to the search bar and type Toy Story, right? And press enter, and then uh, one of the results is Toy Story, so you click that, and then you know maybe get a Netflix account, and then maybe after a few minutes, hey, you're watching Toy Story, great. All right, that's the state of app search today, right? We have these amazing devices in our pockets that you know can do more than anybody ever imagined, and yet it takes you like a full five minutes to go from the query watch Toy Story to watching Toy Story, right? So we realize that, when, when we thought about how to make App Search better. And we, we have some, uh, so my team actually at Quixi, the research team, uh, we're, we're working to just improve that, to get rid of that, that kind of lag. Um, we have a really big, a, a really big unifying <coughs> of, of how all software should be searched for. So I'm talking about software uh, inside apps, but also software on the web, just all software in general. Uh, it all started when we made some observations. We made some observations that uh, functionality on the web was point to point similar in a lot of ways to functionality inside apps. So here's an example of Domino's. The Domino's homepage on the web and the Domino's app, point to point similar. <coughs> all the same functions that you see in one, you have in the other. Same with the Zappos website, point to point similar to that Zappos app. Here's the exact same pair of UGG boots. I mean, they're obviously both making the same requests to the same API, extracting out the same data, right? You start to see the world as a bunch of clients for a bunch of functional endpoints in the cloud. At least we do. We don't think that the web and apps are that different, especially today's web apps that are shifting more and more into you know, client-side code and data on the wire and, and shifting away from static HTML. So the picture we see today is, is one of what we call functions. Uh, so over here on the left, you've got wants, things you want. And under wants, you've got functions. Functions are the set of technologically feasible wants. So in this case, maybe you want to have a clean house. Great, so on the right, you've got technology. Technology helps us get what we want. So if you want to have a clean house, you can use a broom, you can use a mop, you can use a vacuum cleaner. Technology helps us get what you want. So that, that was the picture we started with. And we made the connection that in the case of software, like here's Yelp, here's me searching for karaoke and Yelp, uh, here's me on the iPhone app, here's me on the Android app. We made the connection that like, it seems like the same relationship that we had before, where if what you want to do is list nearby karaoke places, you can do it on the web, you can do it with a web server that gives you static files, you can do it with a piece of JavaScript, 
You can do it with apps. You can do it with a Yelp app. You can do it with a Yelp app on you know any one of the of the five different platform mobile platforms that Yelp runs on. And then over here, see what just happened? I put a pin with the URL on it. We have this idea of like, wait a minute. Everything that's worth doing as a function, no matter how you do it, whether it's apps or on the web, everything that's worth doing as a function is worth pinning a URL to. And when you do that, you get what we call the functional web. The functional web is the web of functions. It's a web that's namespaced by URLs. So if I'm, going, if I'm opening my Yelp app and I'm searching for karaoke in my Yelp app, or if I'm viewing the listing for a karaoke bar in my Yelp app, then it's just as meaningful to say I'm at a URL as, as to talk about that when I'm on the regular web. So this, this idea of any URL stuff has been around for so long on the web, and we realize all you have to do is go up a little level of abstraction and apply it to apps. When you do that, then you get the functional web. Right? It's the web of functions namespaced by URLs. We talk about Quixi as having a functional search, a search where you can type what you want to do, and then you can get apps that do that. Today, Quixi's functional search is a search that returns apps, as if apps are the unit of functionality. The future of app search is to make the unit of functionality be the function, the URL identified function. And it's a higher level vision than one that's specific to apps or the web. It's a functional search that's actually for functions. And that actually requires a whole new set of search technology, which are all entirely outside of the scope of this talk. But yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. I'll, I'll take your questions. So do you have any? Uh, yeah, sorry, do you have any measures of diversity in your search rankings? Because when I search for food, yeah. for instance, um, almost all the top ten were about lose weight and calorie tracker mm -hmm. and all that, instead of other uh, apps which could be food and wine or something along those lines. Sure. Okay, that's, that's something that partly emerges from uh, a simplifying assumption we made. So, uh, one, one thing I said about Quixi Search is, uh, I didn't point it out as a simplifying assumption, but it's a simplifying assumption. I said that we take query out pairs and we map them to scores. When you map a bunch of things to a score and then presumably you rank highest score first, suddenly you've you've taken out your ability to, to do diversity because when you train the machine learner, it's not thinking about diversity. So yeah, so the, the answer is no, and we apologize if sometimes the diversity is bad for the moment, but we're gonna improve it. Yeah, I have a question. I, I just, you know, use your website and sure. there, is a, um, uh, there is an app for uh, teaching you how to uh, make a great portrait. It's called right. Great Portrait. So I had a good portrait and then I got to, to the place. <coughs> number four also actually it has five stars. Mm -hmm. But the first one has five stars, the fourth one has five stars. In between they have three stars. Right. But those in between two are actually uh, virtually unidentical. And I was wondering whether you filter out things. Like you have, you know, 20 different editions, for example. Now you filter out only one, it's the same app, uh, just the same 20 different editions. You do that? Um, are you saying do we filter out duplicate editions of the same app? Not duplicate editions, but say different editions, right? So you would present the app only once? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do. So it doesn't work perfectly, but for example, I mentioned like 50 editions of Angry Birds. We really try to lump them together under one Angry Birds if we can. But because it's a, it's not a um, it's a machine learning process, and sometimes it doesn't work perfectly. So, okay, so it doesn't catch you, you know, the, you know, duplicates. The yeah, duplicates. there might be accidental duplicates, but yeah. you know, we keep working to reduce those. Uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt for the to cut to the time. Let's have the last two questions. Okay. And the, the speaker will stay a little longer, so feel free to talk to me. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Uh, just search. <coughs> Uh, on your website, um, yeah. up to kill pigs. Uh -huh. <laughs> second, second result was Angry Birds, uh -huh. so very good. And Thanks. second one was uh, an app called Humble that I never heard of. Yeah. And I read the description as not to kill pigs. So <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> 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 yeah. Satisfied yeah. customer. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, so do you track user behavior? And if you do, do you take that into account in your search functions? 
So we, like I said, it's the feedback cycle is not where we want it to be. We do get a lot of user logs um, on our own end and sent back to sent back from our partners. We've never automated the feedback cycle in any way. It's partly intentional because you can't do something naive like, oh, this is getting clicked on a lot. Let's rank it higher. The moment you do that, it's like you know, spam or heaven, right? Like, great, you just have a bot clicking, clicking on it a bunch. Yeah. So you can't be that naive. Uh, what you have to do is is look at the data and get a sense of what's going on. Make sure nobody's trying to spam you, and then go and uh, you know, go and fix your underlying algorithm if there's any systematic error to be fixed there. So yeah, nothing automated though. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I want to introduce a little bit myself before somebody asked me how long I've been working in the um, search industry. And I had to use my calculator later on, and the answer is 16 years. That means two things. One is I'm old. Secondly, this industry has been there for, for a while. And I was at that time integrating a software called Search 97. And the, the number 97 and the year, and it was at that time a cool thing, I can tell you. Now it's like forever. So I'm the founder and CEO of, uh, of Inventa. I made this speech uh, last week in San Francisco at the Conversion Conference. Um, some of the parts of this speech is kind of too basic for you guys, so I'm going to try to go fast with that, and especially if I see you having like a boring face, I'm, I'm going to move as fast as, as possible. Um, and the whole thing is about, is about search. So I'm not going to tell you how a search works. It's just uh, I have my content, and then this spider goes through the content, takes everything, and stores every word and everything that uh, was found in my website in this thing called index. So the search doesn't actually use the documents. The search uses the index. So there are two kinds of search. Well, there are many more, like app search and many other searches. But in my mind, it's like two different search. The internet search, which is basically something that today is dominated by Google, and 3% of the market share. And it has, the Google index has 50 billion pages. So I made this short calculation. If I spent uh, eight hours a day reading the whole internet, I would need something like 1,800 lives <laughs> okay. before I get the whole internet. You know, correct, and by then probably you know, the internet will be a bit different. <laughs> so I'm gonna be look like that like two thousand times before I, I finish that job. So um, I'm gonna talk about on-site search. It's this search that is used in these websites they have search files. And some folks call it enterprise search, sometimes it's called on-site search, website search are different names, but at the end, it's a competitive market, so it's not dominated by any vendor, um, except that when you read any of these vendors' website, they say they are the leaders. <laughs> Actually, they are not. There's no one vendor today that dominates in the sense that Google dominates the internet uh, search. And the other difference is, instead of searching on billions of contents, search is restricted from a few hundred to maybe a few million contents, most, most of them. Some of the things about search. These bears spend eight seconds on a website on average before deciding to go into something else. When navigation fails, 50% of them, of users, go to search. 71 of um, e-commerce users find their products using search. 90% uh, using site search to access self-service content or to help. And yet, 50% of most web searches are abandoned. That's, that's the data, So, which is hard, and it's like it was mentioned already, search doesn't work. This is just an example here. This is State Farm. I hope that nobody from State Farm is here now. That happened to me once. It was like, I work for State Farm. I'm responsible for search. Well, they have this search over there, and I was trying a simple search query, which was, do you insure sale votes? And it had all these things like education planning, auto accident. Um, so one 
would assume, well, they don't sell this thing. And the point is that if you look careful, they do. It's that this page basically says that, and this is the product that they sell. And so it's just that the search is unable to, to find it. So what's the problem? The problem, we believe, is most of search engines are based on keywords. They find documents, they find things that contain the words that I typed in. Not necessarily that what I meant by these keywords. And to us, the solution, actually it's one solution, but to us it's the solution to that problem is using natural language processing applied to search. So first, what is natural language processing? What is, what is language? Language is system of symbols governed by rules of combination to transfer information. So that's anything. And they are divided into two, formal languages and natural languages. Formal languages are created by humans, and they are not ambiguous, and they are easy to process by a computer. Examples of formal languages, Java, JavaScript, Python, PHP, HTML, XML, and anything that ends with an L probably is a formal language. Even the math notation is a formal language. I don't understand that, but I know that somebody will understand and it is not, it's not ambiguous. And the other kind of languages are natural languages, like English, Spanish, French. And interestingly enough, they are not created by humans. Although, if humans did not create English, who did, right? Well, is that there is no one particular human who designed any of these natural languages. They, they occur naturally, and we learn the natural language when we are children. We cannot learn when we are older. You can try, like me, but then the accents are really weird. <laughs> and they are very difficult to process by a computer. This is an example of that language map in Europe. I didn't use the language map of US because it's kind of boring. But for example, if you take this place here, I'm from here, I'm from Barcelona. And uh, when I'm here, people say, hey, you don't have a Spanish accent. And uh, that's true, because I don't speak Spanish. I speak this language called Catalan. And I have this Catalan accent. But because nobody speaks Catalan here, you might think that it's kind of exotic. But it's not. It's just, everybody there speaks, <laughs> speaks pretty much like this. So, how can we deal with natural language? There are many ways to approach the language. One of them is using computational linguists. It's entering into the model of natural language and from a linguistic point of view, trying to analyze it. This guy here is Noam Chomsky. He's the father of called the modern linguistics. And um, he basically, created this concept, this grammar tree that we learn when we are kids, where any sentence said in natural language, human natural language has somehow a structure. And it can be, this is a structure of this kind of, form of a tree, with a verb, a noun, sentence, etc. So basically, that approach says that by using a grammar, we can analyze natural language. Which is true, but has several problems. First, if we take a look to these sentences, like, I need to get some bread, I get the idea, we need to get home. I can have all these trees for these sentences, but actually, from a semantic point of view, the, word, the, the, the verb get means very different things. It means buy at the beginning, get ideas, actually understand the idea, get home is arrive home. And, uh, that is something that Chomsky wouldn't tell us because they have their own tree, so it's difficult to know these sort of things. That's another example. We've seen the payment, break, break a code, reverse a decision, demolish a house, dispel fear. Basically, these very different verbs actually mean the same thing, which is somehow undo something. It's just that depending on the thing, you will not use undo. You will use these specialized verbs to, to deal with all that. More examples. Close an account and cancel an account would mean pretty much the same. But close a door and cancel a door don't mean the same. Actually, cancel a door doesn't mean anything. It's like, what, what do you mean by that? Although cancel a door is grammatically perfect, is 
meaningless from a natural language point of view. So this guy here, Igor um, Melchuk, was, is Melchuk, not Melchuk? Igor Melchuk. Oh, do you know him? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you something. Um, I don't know him personally, but people at Inventa uh, do, and he's very happy with uh, Inventa because we have implemented his theoretical model in our software. Mm -hmm. But every single time I, I, I tell his name, I do it one way. So, like, I, um, so it's, it's Melchuk, right? Okay. Igor Milchuk. Igor Milchuk. He's Russian, right? And uh, a big investment on natural language processing was made during the Cold War. And uh, State of Defense was investing money to try to automatically translate from Russian into English, you not know, to spy these guys um, as efficiently as possible. And basically, at that time, the United States was using uh, Noam Chomsky's theories to do with all that. But at the same time, the Soviet Union, this guy was applying a totally different approach. Instead of grammar, he was using this thing called meaning text theories that I'm going to talk to you about, and uh, lexical functions. And but the objective was the same, was translated from English to Russian in order to spy. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the guy lost his job, and now he's living in, in Canada, and he's teaching his, his theory over there. And uh, we met the guy, he's really nice, you know, he uh, has a job in, in this uh, Montreal University, that has um, a partnership with the Barcelona University, and uh, we have several computational linguists who work with us, and you know, we know him. So that's some of this concept of the meaning text theory. If you take play guitar, drive car, ride a motorbike, do a favor, that all these sentences make sense. If I, they, if I say, can I play you a car? You want to say, what do you want to do exactly? Or if I say, um, can, you do me, uh, can you make me a favor? It's like, well, that's Jordi because his English is not good, but you don't, you don't make favors, you do favors, right? So these relationships are much more fixed and they are much more limited than we might think. So the theory behind that is that we think that human language is infinite in the combinations that we can do, but actually, underneath, they are very much limited. So the problem is kind of simpler than actually looks like if you take the right linguistic approach. The same for, imagine, heavy smoker, sleep like a log, uh, strong coffee, well, hers it. If I, guess, if I say that I smoke like a log, you say, well, what, what do you mean? But actually, all these things mean the same, is a lot of something. These are called lexical functions. The first lexical function is called, is called oper, which means operate something. So I'm operating a, to operate a guitar. I play the guitar, right? Um, the second one is called magna, is, is make something big, right? So a heavy smoker makes a big smoker. And this is another lexical function. So according to this theory, there are 72, exactly 72 lexical functions um, shared among all human languages in the world. I don't know why 72, but that is the theory. And from, out from the 72, we took 15, and our software is based, is based on that. So how does natural language search? Well, basically, is using all these concepts of natural language processing and using these lexical functions in order to implement search. So we have, in one hand, the search query in one side, and what we have to do when search is kind of match with words, with documents that they are in the other side. So natural language search is, <coughs> instead of working with the top of the iceberg, instead of working with the words from the search query and the words from the document, is working with all this information underneath, which is meaning. And meaning can be rich, can be big, They're, they have different interpretations, but basically this natural language search works from the meaning of the search query, trying to match the meaning of the documents. There's a specific thing for the e-commerce search, that we are working on that. Uh, we just released this uh, version um, last month. But basically what we discover for e-commerce is there is a combination of what user search, they use words to describe sometimes product names, sometimes brands, and sometimes properties of these products. So if I, if I search for a laptop of 
four gigabytes. Um, laptop is the name, the name of the product, and four gigabytes is a description of the, one of the properties. But there are so many ways that I can say four gigabytes, actually, four GB, four gigabytes, etc. And that happens for all these dimensions, and can be thousands of dimensions. So um, applying this natural language, trying to separate what is the product name and what is one of these um, features is actually capital to first search better and second have a better conversion rate. <coughs> now it's just examples about that. This uh, Lamp Sports, this, these guys use EasyAsk, it's a natural language processing um, search engine to power, so they have able to, to search like con contemporary desk lamps and find relevant results. This guy here is Sergeant Star, the Army website. You can ask questions for this guy. It's pretty, it's pretty good. That's an example um, powered by Inventa, by the way. Um, um, I search here, can I send a picture with my phone? And the answer was sending and receiving an SMS, MMS, and etc. Well, MMS is this concept related to send multimedia using a phone. So here we are basically using these lexical functions to relate send plus picture plus, plus phone all together with MMS. And it is not made for one client, it's in general in our dictionary. So we have this big dictionary with all these semantic relationships. eBay, I couldn't. <laughs> avoid to use some of the eBay examples here. So I was, um, I was searching here, where is my item? That's, that's my search. And I got results like, why is my item not showing up in the search results, blah, blah, blah. So there are different answers here. I think they are not that relevant, especially because you guys have this content here in the search section that says, well, basically, what is my item, right? So I have the, 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 the code and I can, I can Basically, see. This example is a postal service in Spain, it's our customer. So I'm searching exactly the same question is, where is my item? And the answer is, well, individual tracker. So basically, I can add my track information, I will get information about that. Budget is using um, Intel response, so not our, our competitors, but still they're using natural language to get an increase of online sales by 35%, just by, by, by solving questions online. This, uh, no, this is our example here is like, I'm not trying you to read all this, but is, is, this is Granger and the two very similar search queries like TV, TV, TV 22 inches and television 22 inches. They get totally different results. And basically because the same search query obtains totally different, just because of the pictures that are different. That's Ticketmaster, one of our um, Customers, for example, searching here, theater in Barcelona next weekend. And what the system does is first, okay, you are looking in Barcelona. So Barcelona is not the name of the show, it's the city where the thing is happening. And because you said next weekend, we understand that in this specific <coughs> search, you are looking for one particular date interval. So we are getting this information from the actual user request. And by using this sort of natural language technologies, uh, we were able to improve this 18% in the click rate, which is basically sales. As another example, this Amazon, these guys have very cool things, even if they don't really much publish it, but they, they understand things like monitor, 22 inches, under 200. They understand that under $200 is a price and they sell it only this this uh, this price and that's that's an example of this e-commerce search searching for one of the uh, properties with this with this uh, price. Another example, um, Getmin is one of the companies of Ticketmaster in UK. They are our customer, and the search here was changed date of the concert. That's is what the user searched, and the answer is an event was rescheduled and can no longer attend. So change a date is rescheduled. That's an example of using these lexical functions as opposed to change my password means a completely different thing. So the word change, depending on what you change, the synonyms and the relationships might be totally different. That's where these lexical functions um, are, are useful. Another example here is 
This is Groupon, one of our customers here, and uh, this is the help center page. And as you type your email, when you want to send an email to Groupon, we pull some FAQs to say, okay, maybe this FAQ will solve your problem, so we will not send the email, so we'll save some money. And uh, in this case, is the restaurant doesn't take my, my calls. And the answer is, I can get in touch with the business. Well, take a call, take a call, and get in touch. They are somehow related, not because of get, not because of call, but because the whole relationship, which is actually rather limited, is this fixed expression, this semi-fixed expression that we have in every natural language. Is more e-commerce another language? This is um, Brazil, Portuguese. I'm searching. Zapatos para meninas, which means pretty much shoes for girls. And I'm getting shoes for girls, even if the word girl is not in the actual description of the, of the product. This is desk.com. I'm searching, I would like to see a demo. And I had 2,500 results. Not bad, when actually the first result was case sumer list. Well, I don't know. But they have this answer. How does a 14-day free trial Work. So demo and free trial are somehow related. It's just that that search engine, because is keyword-based, is unable to find the actual, the actual answer. Another example here, Iberia. This is an, an airline. The user question here was, can I bring a cat? And the answer is, can I travel with pets? Which is, well, they don't give particular information about cats, but they do give information about, about pets. This is US Bank. They are using Inquira from Oracle, a supposedly natural language search. Yet, I'm searching here, and I insert my card, and I got like flex, pex, cash rewards, <laughs> and uh, income. Is it Oracle? Oracle search? They use Inquira. <laughs> or, yeah, this is uh, Inquira was acquired. Well, it, it's, not, it's not cheap, right? So, so <laughs> you work for US Bank. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, basically, you're sh showing us that all these search engines are based on keywords, and then if you give it natural language that contains like prepositions, uh, parts yeah, parts of speech, speech that they don't, they don't uh, parse the the sentence, they don't look at like the sense. Like, like the keyboard keyboard keyword search very often uses this concept called language. So they take the, the user question and say, oops, this word is bad because it's too common. So they disregard like articles and propositions. But take the they take the, 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 the sentence, it's like you don't like me. If I remove the first like, only it's okay. But the second like is important because it's the verb like. And that's why that's where keyword-based search fails miserably at actually understanding that any search query is made by humans and by definition is, is natural language. So if, if you were able to get data, like the distribution of all the queries that were entered for like a month or like two weeks, um, do you know like what part of uh, would, would be like queries like this versus just like where people have learned how to use keywords? I was curious, like do you monitor to see or just that they improve their their click through their search. You mean that do customers search like that or versus yeah. searching by keywords? Yeah. Is that is that pretty much your, your question? Yeah. No, but well, I, I see that you get better you got better results. That you had customers like hey we have yeah. analyze. Yeah. So that's um, the bottom yes. line. Yes. And I'm using here like exaggerated natural language yeah. things, right? But actually users are as any other living organism are lazy. So the less energy you, you use on something, the better. And search is not is not different than that. So you will type as few words as possible. Yet you will need some words sometimes to describe what you want. Even what you think they are keywords, they're not. The relationship between these words are really relevant. This example, can I answer my card? That's a perfect English sentence. Very often sentences don't have a, a right grammar, they are mixed up, and they have spell problems, uh, but yet, very often, the answer is not just pulling documents that contain these words. The answer is trying to get the maximum out of these words to get to build a, a meaning and answer based on that, on that meaning. Can I ask, 
her question. So you search in the kind of you know positive way. Give me what I want. What if I don't want something? Can I kind of you know give you a hint what I don't want so you would feel it out for me? Like narrative, like uh, uh, I, I like like um, I want uh, for example uh, silk fabric, but the one I can wash rather than uh, requiring um, uh, you know uh, professional. Or like an example would be I want a hotel in the San Francisco Bay Area, but not in San Francisco City, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> using the filter sound. Okay. Maybe that. Um, well, this this is negation. Um, right. Uh, my yeah. question, just you know, out of curiosity, do you you know have it, or you know of any other search engines that you have it? Well, sometimes negative things are the clue to find the content. So if you say I, I cannot eat pork, for example. A good answer would be, this is our special me meals for in, in our plants. So because you said that you cannot do something, uh, the answer would be a positive thing, not the opposite thing. And absolutely, we use, we use this for a lot of things. I mean, it's like it doesn't answer your question. Uh, so so, so I, I, I have to explicitly uh, say, cannot or not or something like that, right? Yeah, you oh, say, oh, you oh, say oh. I don't, I don't. You have meals that don't contain meat. Okay. Meat. So, so you, you recognize the Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, absolutely. Do you go around looking for idioms? When you search through the document, you actually look for idioms of uh, the match. When you show them the first couple of slides, when you actually show it. Strong coffee, sleep like a log. So you're actually talking about idioms and the normal users, right? Absolutely. So when you do that, how, I just wondered, so did you actually, my, so we have a new client, like the one we have from Spain. So did you, so did you actually, you know, the Spanish grammar problem is different from, and I know for a fact it's actually slightly is different from English. Every, every language has a different <coughs> Right, so did you actually build a new language? Why we don't understand each other when we speak our languages? So did you, build a, did you build a new corpus and did you actually, uh, so, so when a client comes to you and says, okay, this is what I need, you actually have to go and start learning the whole thing? Yes. And our approach is not statistic. So the good thing is that it's not about machine learning. We don't, we can't afford learning because when we have our first customer, it must be perfect from the first day. So we don't, we don't use machine learning. And I don't believe in it as natural language. So if, what is your, can I ask your, your native language? I'm assuming that it's not English, but I don't know. Oh, mine is Telugu. It's, uh... Telugu. So, um, if I if somebody sits me down in this chair for one week, um, watching Telugu television after one week, and they say, "What did you learn?" The answer is going to be zero. I don't know. I after I just I, I nobody taught me. So I need a teacher. I need somebody to teach me. And I, I need um, first being a child, and secondly, or if I'm, I'm grown up, I need somebody to teach me a language. So this is basically what we did. The the, the problem is. We have our technology available with this big lexicon for some languages, not every language in the world. So if tomorrow uh, we have a project in Russian, we have to say no. We, our technology is not today ready for Russian because the lexicon is not. Is so not all ready. the models actually manually built, right? They are manually built by a team of computational linguists that work on that. So every time, because this, this is a SaaS platform, Every time one of these computational linguists working at Inventa adds something to the dictionary, all the customers benefit from that. But from other side, uh, you can transform any sentence to many, many sentences in the same language, preserving meaning yep. or different languages. So there's supposed to be connections between your models, right? Yes. So uh, we have like some universal. Yeah. Yeah. You all it. yeah, we haven't worked in this trans language <laughs> modeling, but basically they are, as you said, many ways to say the same thing. It's just that there are not infinite ways to say the same thing. They are finite, and that, that's what our, our model works in. In that case, if we come to the United States, for example, the way people speak English, not everybody gets the Indian correct, right? So does the system perform actually, how does it handle that? I mean, do you expect people to say, okay, they'll figure it out, well, and then in this yeah. country they'll figure it out anyway, or do you actually figure it out? The, our model is, even if um, you, you would understand someone from Britain, right, from England, as well as you understand someone from Kansas, right? 
They speak differently, the vocabulary is different, lexical functions are different, but you still can understand them because you have some sort of <coughs> wider understanding of the English language. We do the same. So English is one English in our lexicon that contains all different variations of all different languages. It is actually very rare that you might have an issue understanding something. We found one example, one example in Spanish from Colombia, where there you say, well, if I, if I tell you I want to cancel my credit card, what would you understand? But I don't want the credit card anymore, right? Well, these guys, the Spanish version, they say cancel credit card, meaning paying the credit card every month. So you, they go to this <laughs> banking application and they say, I want to cancel my credit card. I say, yeah, this is how what you, what you have to do to get rid of your credit card. Like, this is not what I want. So these examples um, are the ones that in our lexicon we take into account if the person that is talking is in Colombia or not. But for the rest of the cases, actually, it's, it's pretty much clear even if they use different idioms and lexical functions. Like, if you if you take Mexico, for instance, and we in Spain, we say that we um, manage cars to say, uh, to say uh, a drive. So we say manage a car. Well, it's crazy, but it's the way it is. In Mexico, they say conduct a car. So still, yeah, maybe the other way around. The other way. Yeah. We, in Spain, we, we say, conduct a car, and in Mexico they manage a car. <laughs> That's a lexical function. The upper lexical function is the same. And very often when I go to, Lexi to Mexico, these guys talk to me, I understand every single word, but I don't get what they mean often, because until I get used to all of that. Any Mexican here? <laughs> <laughs> the same for English. English, New Zealand, um, they use different, different lexical functions. And when languages evolve, it's very interesting to see how uh, they get, not anymore because we, we live in a global world, blah, 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 but like centuries ago, when <coughs> people went to another continent, killed all the indigenous, and they started in country from scratch, the languages started dividing. I was not thinking of the US, I was thinking like the Roman Empire, for instance. Then um, the languages started to divide into different other languages, and vocabulary evolves very, um, very slowly, but these lexical functions change very quickly from one regional, from regional variations. And uh, the use of prepositions changes very quickly. And even very often, very quickly, you find two languages with a similar vocabulary with rather different lexical functions. So they start <coughs> not understanding each other even if the words are known by, by each other. <coughs> so the point is that you use bank does sell Car insurances. That was that was my, my point. eBay, 16 gigabyte iPhone, and I get this sort of girly thing, right? So it's like, what what, what is that? Well, eBay search is so good. It was so hard for me to find an example that didn't work. That I only figured out this 16 instead of 16 as an example. But yet, um, in nat in our natural language model, if you write 16 or 16, would be the same concept, the same. Lemma, the same, the same thing, right? Or another example from eBay as well. Maybe I made too much of those. Do you do you take uh, Amex? And the answer is, oh yes, video. How to take better pictures? <laughs> what? What is that, right? Well, actually, they have this answer saying which are the accepted payment methods. And Amex is American Express, which is nothing than uh, payment. Method. This is another example here. This is PC Mobile. It's another e-commerce website. Laptop 4 GB RAM to one TB disk has all these results, and the other a very similar like laptop 4 GB bytes of REM. So the, the same the same search, search query basically. I get very different results. Just if you take a look to the pictures, they are pretty much uh, different. Don't use keywords. That's, that's basically our, our, our thing here. I'm not trying to describe exactly how our algorithm works uh, because I'm not a CTO and because that would take too long. But the idea is use all these things, these structures that are reliant and uh, that are in the language to improve and have a better, a better search. 
I mean, I get this point, but, <clears throat> but given that keywords also work, can't you think of an ensemble technique where you take your natural language lexicon, take keywords, put it together and take the best off, or mm -hmm. you can have the same thing, so you can improve even more. I'm sure your search also, in some cases, does not deliver what a keyword search delivers. We, um, in so, so some customers, for example, they have their keyword search for the website, mm -hmm. and then we combine that with natural language search for the knowledge base for support. And it works pretty well. It's like, well, whatever you search, if, let's say, Google Sites worked okay for you, it's okay, but then we combine this with search on support. So if, if you search something that is related to support, you might have valid answers. Actually, we have some sort of plugin for the Google Search Appliance. Um, and, uh, and we basically plug Eventa into the Google Search Appliance to create the search experience that combines keywords and natural language search, but specialized in the in the support area. Can you show us some examples of how site is used? How examples of websites? So how your site is worth? How does it better? Um, I, I would, but I don't have an internet connection here. <coughs> oh, darn. Wi-Fi. <laughs> 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 Sure, I can do that, no problem. <laughs> I'm just using different um, windows so I can, I can do things without showing you how miserable and how, how I'm, I'm, I'm suffering over there. But absolutely, absolutely yes. Any more questions as I try to connect here? So, um, is there some integration between natural language search and the keyword-based search, such as, say, having a query rewrite and extracting features from the document so that their metadata that you <clears throat> use a regular search engine keyword-based for? Okay, first, my Wi-Fi is off. I, I said my Apple beautiful Mac turn Wi-Fi on, and it's basically not. So I'm going to reboot the machine. Okay. So I'll, 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 I'll be I'll be back. Um, back to your back to your question. Actually, I have to confess that when we started our own software in 2009, we said, well, what if we have a natural language processor and then the search capability? We will use an existing keyword-based search engine. And um, for a while, it it seemed to be a good idea. The problem is <coughs> that even the indexing process must be natural language. Sure. And and we couldn't tell this like Lucene or this sort of, of, of search like if you if you if you read read an article and you get for instance let's see this is a very simple example. For instance, well and I have, you know, if I search how many instances of your software I have to install, please don't show me all this for instance because for instance, it's nothing to do with the word instant. It's, an ex it's a fixed expression. Mm -hmm. And um, Lucene and many other, even, even Google search appliance, are not that good at handling with that, even at indexing problem, indexing process. So the, the, the combination that we have when we combine natural language and, and keywords is by using this sort of, um, what we call one box search. You search in one box, from the user perspective, and results are divided into this is natural language for this particular piece of your of your website, and these are these other results from the rest of the of the. So it's not that we don't believe in keywords. Very often, you know, if you search, I don't know, X, Y, Z, and there is one document with that title. Come on, this is the answer. You know, no other, no other way, right? Um, so, it's, but we, it's, it's not like don't use keywords. That our our model is every human search query is natural language somehow by by nature, and so it might be a keyword, but you cannot rely on other keywords. I, I don't know if that answered your your question. As I'm trying to, okay, I'll, I'm sort of. <laughs> <coughs> eBay guest. I'm getting there. I'm going to show the password. So if I 
type in growth, you can tell me. Why? So far, so good, right? So, a further question about that. So, do you have any customers where, <coughs> say, they would have two searches going on at the same time, one by keyword, one by natural language, and blend the result to make sure that? There yes, is, we, we do. You do. Um, have yeah, we, we do have this sort of uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, customers where we have uh, many of our applications is for support for the search in the knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet, then they have these hundreds of thousands of documents somewhere else. They are happy with keyword. And they, and they combine the natural language with keywords in one certain page. And yes, we have, we have many of these, of these customers. What kind of database do you use? Do you use database? Internally? Yes. How we do this internally? The whole thing, well, Spider, Indexer, Search Engine, everything has been developed using the PHP program language. Why? I don't know. It's like uh, my CTO of that. And um, for what we call the, the development environment, which is the lexicon and the environment where computational linguists work, everything is based on MySQL, is a natural language, is a SQL database, a relational database. But then, when we actually create the index that goes to live environment to search, then we have this hash um, binary um, file. So it's not it's not when you actual search and get the results. Key value. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's a key value, and uh, it's it's a it's written in the C programming language. It's a very low level, but basically it's, it's a hash table when you say this word and you get. The, the result very very quickly. So it's not it's not um, relational anymore. So we, we work on the on the environment where we have this um, MySQL for administering the whole thing. But when we compile the our customers and they go live, search happens in these hash indexing um, files. What's the largest deployment for a like index like this in terms of the number of documents that you have? That's an extremely good question because if we would try to index the 50 billion, we would die <coughs> in that. So the answer is more than 1 million documents, our search starts to get slow, a little bit slow. We have implemented a customer like with 5 million. It works, it's okay. But um, when our application goes to index more than 1 million documents, is come on, what, what do you have in here? <laughs> so maybe it's a product search, maybe it's something else, right? So let's say that our search is good for documents that contain like good titles, good descriptions, good body of the documents, um, and they are big under the one million in number. There's no limit, physical limit, but let's say that more than one million is not is not a meta that we will use. And the follow-up is that given that you're talking about meaning. How much of a document do you actually index? You have to index very little part of the document, which actually is the most meaningful part. So what happens? There is, there is a, depending on the application, right? But there is um, a hierarchy. So the most important for us is the title, then is the description, then is the paragraphs in the body, pretty much. So another example of application that we are not that good is when we have to index PDF files, and every PDF file has like 200 pages. It's like, come on. The problem is not finding the right PDF. The problem is finding the, the page, right, where, where the thing is. And uh, PDF is not very good to, you know, to, to tell, I want to go to that particular page when I, I open the, the thing. So that's why um, for these sort of applications where Especially when the title is Microsoft Word, blah 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 blah. It's like this is not a title. It's not even a title of the PDF. It's just the name of the Word document that originated. So we we made 
some um, prospects that they say, oh, great, I have all these PDFs that nobody can find. And we can't, we can't help them that much because mm -hmm. Very often these PDF files are huge and uh, the titles are not descriptive and then below in the PDF you get text, 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 text. That is like it's, it's difficult to know which is the hierarchy of what is more important than that. So to answer your question is let's see, one hundred percent I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna show you here what we call the, the back stitch. This is the backend application that uh, all of our customers uh, use. So I'm gonna I'm gonna log in here. And because I'm the boss, I want to have access to all the documents in the world. When actually our customers I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose one one of these. Our customers have access to um, all in their own, but they, everybody accesses this this uh, backstage. So I have this. Well, this is the statistic package. Is well, how many questions we had, how many clicks on the answers, um, and we have these settings parts. And the settings part, you basically say where in your documents you want to search and how important is are these these elements from the result. This example. Let's say that the title, if you, if you see the column called realm, it says that is 100% important. Then this alternative, which is like an alternative title, is 98% important. And go all the way down to this free text, which is basically the, the answer, is 40% important, respect the total of the data. So when you search, you can change that all the time. You can also say, well, we will apply this semantic expansion not to everything, but just the titles. And I, I don't bother if this little text here has this remote relationship. You, 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 you can say, I don't want to index that, and you can work on it all like that. So basically here, you say you, you, in your documents what importance you want to give to each one. And it's totally configurable. My, my question is slightly different. And I'm not sure. Because you're indexing the meaning, you can, by looking at the document, you can somehow say that this is more meaningful and this is less meaningful. Correct. And then you can say, I don't want to index the less meaningful part, and I will index yeah. only the more meaningful part. I don't know what the meaning means. Well, to me, to, to yeah, you. let's say title is more meaningful than the body of the language. Can your system automatically? No, you, you go here and you say which is the relative importance of one particular uh, part of the part of the of basically basically yes. So I'm going to show you here how our thing works internally. I'm going to I'm going to search for one particular customer code just to you know it's not like showing the. So it's not it's not my aim to you know to um, but just uh, I think it's is how the internally the algorithm works. I'm going to this um, what we call the test, you know, which basically says when the you search and you have a result, where you get your, your results from. So I'm gonna search here, does my child have to pay? This is a natural question to Ticketmaster in Spain, in English. That's an example, an example. And um, what we have here is for the analysis is to, um, well, well, this is that's my child. So this is the analysis of word by word and how it's been uh, analyzed. We use this concept of frequency. So we have this TF, IFD, what was that? We use that. But we use it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know that we use that. But and I also know that we use it in an extended fashion. So let, let me let me tell you a cool thing that worked very well for us. If you take this the child frequency is one point one. And what does it mean? So you might if there is a child, 
it's either one times or two times. What does 1.1 times mean? Well, this is one of our secret sauce, is the documents themselves don't contain child. They contain a semantically similar word. When we compute this frequency, the concept of frequency is not anymore an integer. It's a real number using as decimals as you want. That's why we know what is important and what is not important. So we use the TFIFD algorithm without actually um, having to have the exact word, but similar word. And the, the longer is the distance, semantically, the more this frequency changes. And that, that, that creates excellent results. So the point that if you, if you see the, the actual answer here, um, is which is the age restriction to pay for attending a show. So that's even, you know, because that matching happens at that level. At that so I'm not entering to explain all these numbers here, but basically in this particular case, the score was 91%. And um, we also have this, we believe that it's not worth it to give like 1,000 results to one user. So we could, we could because we could have thousands and thousands of results because there is always something that is remotely related to something else. But if the first result is good enough, we believe that it's better not to show the second result. You, you can just skip it. And um, so that's why we have here these static settings, which basically say, things here, could, could, could next is basically say, well, if your first result is, let's say, 1, and the second result is 0 0.6, don't show it, because the relevancy is so low compared. So the first one is so good that if you have only three results, all of them bad, but similarly bad, you show it, maybe, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be the, the, the actual the actual answer. So that's this is the way in this in these parameters where we pretty much configure how the, the output uh, can be. And so you can limit and say I want I want to be very restrictive and only show results that are good, uh, or you can relax the thing and say well try to find something. And um, confessing here, often with our customers, first version we kind of put our tolerance. You know, we are very tolerant, so it's like easy to find an answer. And as uh, the lexicon is, you know, f finished with this particular customer, we don't charge the customer for this because, but we keep the, the intellectual property of the lexicon. So as it gets better and better, we make the system more and more, um, um, all, more less tolerant to bad results. So it's, How large is your lexicon? How, how, how big? Um, it's about, um, um, I'm going to tell you exactly how it is. Because I have it here. So we have two things, words and concepts, or lemmas. Right? So you, you guys know that better than I, than I do. So we have in English, 58,000 words. Um, 40,000 40, concepts. So if I search, if I search here, for example, U.S. A word, we would get one word is U.S. but two different lemmas, which is United States and us the pronoun. So if you say, if I go here and say test, and then. Uh, test ILF here, which is the natural language processor, pretty much. I can't believe I'm showing that. Yep. Um, you, you really, uh, guys, are, are something. Then it's like, um, can I travel to the US? And I ask the system to analyze that, that sentence. The result is, can I travel? And then U.S. is the United States. But if I go here and I say just contact us, then the answer will be contact 
us, and this is the, the, the pronoun. And that makes the difference. Because you, who, a you and then an S is not a, an S is not a, is not a bad word or a good. That that depends could be the, the key to find the result. So the key thing is understanding what is that. Is the pronoun contact us or is like terms from to the US? And I know these examples work. So if I, I search other examples, might not work. What about come to the US? Come? Come to the US. Or come to us. Yeah. Okay. Come. 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 I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like if, if you think of no US, US would be the they may be more likely to use uh, a different word. Come to us, the pronoun. Yes, yeah, we got it! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. go. No more examples today. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a good one. So it, when you index the documents, do you apply the language uh, model? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the indexing process is linguistic from the beginning. Absolutely. Actually, what we do is we take the documents, we index the, the source of the documents, and then we internally in our index, we expand the document with the lexical functions. So when you search, basically this user query is already there. Is already, that's why it's fast. Some folks do the other way around. They take, they index whatever, and then they take the search query and they expand the search query. That doesn't work, but it's easy to implement. So Inquirer is using that. Big mistake. That's why we know exactly when Inquirer fails miserably because Inquirer is a natural language um, layer on top of a of a keyword-based search engine. So it fails <coughs> every time because when indexing the content, Inquirer does understand it. It only tries to understand the search query and then expand it. And by doing that, they cannot do these things. So we that's why we are we cannot use and, and rely we cannot rely on an existing search uh, keyword based search engine. We had to implement the whole thing from, from scratch. Any question? From, from the perspective of an end user, I'm an end user of enterprise search many times. Your kind of system would be a very good system for as a supplementary system. Because 99% of the time, okay, 90% of the time, the keyword search works very well. So from your business model point of view, are you finding clients who are willing to try it side by side and as a little box on the right hand side? Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, some, we have all kinds of combinations. For example, ex clients that say, well, I'm going to search with my keyword-based search, and if there is no result, I'm going to pass it. Option number one. Option number two is, I'm going to search both. And if you think you have good results, you show your results. Um, ex or or you, you search, and results will be FAQs, plus products, plus the Twitter timeline. If you are indexing your Twitter timeline, you can combine and say, well, the best answer for you is this document and the tweet that was published yesterday. So absolutely, yes. We, that's what we call the one box search. So should I, if I want to tie a system, should I go to US Bank or which place I should try? Um, well, now, like the best. We have a, in our in our website. With, with, come on, Jordi, you can do that. Um, we yeah. have this section called. <laughs> it's called a demo effect. So, great, that's that's wonderful. What what is that? Is it inventa.com, right? Don't rush it. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a network. Well, there is a customers section, and you will have many of them, and there is CEO Live. 
So if companies have already invested in Lucene or they've already got their own keyword search, you built some. You're, you're, I mean, you were pretty explicitly saying you built something from the ground up, but a lot of people have got a lot invested in machine learning rankings, maybe mm -hmm. working pretty well for apps here today. Yeah. How, how would you blend the two together? We say, well, what is the, the thing that you need to improve your search in? Is mm -hmm. the knowledge base for support, for example, or versus the, the, the product search? Mm -hmm. So we believe in, the, in this concept of the one box search, mm -hmm. where uh, even, even, even more, I can show you what, what is that. It is um, one box. And uh, Google has this one box concept. So even the Google search appliance says, well, we're the best search engine in the world, but we might not be that good for specific needs. So the, 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 the one box um, model is uh, basically when you search, the, the GSA um, prepares results, but in parallel, the GCA calls other search engines using XM, an XML protocol. And then, the, the Google Search Appliance collects results from all these other search engines to present one page with a consolidated results. And if you search something like that... So you do two queries in parallel and then blend the results. The Google Search Appliance manages that themselves. So it is built in in the, in the product. So, um, come on, Jordi. DCI one box. Um, so this is our product. We call semantic search uh, Q and A for the Google Search Appliance. So even though we compete with Google Search Appliance sometimes, very often, um, we still have this plug in where you say, "Hey, I, I spent fifty thousand dollars on my Google Search Appliance. Don't tell me that I have to throw it away." So, no, and it's great. Probably first, if you have seven million documents. Google Search Appliance is your option. It's great. It's gonna, it's gonna go perfect. But then you might have this FAQ section where Google Search Appliance is not that good. So using this concept, you can basically integrate this to, to search. That's an example. But in any other search engine, you can do similar similar things. Does this answer your question? Oh yeah. How do you solve the ambiguity? Because you, in your first example, you get, do you list all the possible combinations? Um, let's see if the dimension is not present here. And even if the website doesn't work, at least the bag state works. Yay! So we have here this, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to have the same display or I'm going to get hurt here. So here we have, and it's different for every lexical function, this, um, it's called this ambiguator. Here it is. So it's this top here. And our model to do that is through these ambiguation rules. They are different for every language. It says Something like if you have a noun or if you have an article, then you cannot have a verb. Simple rules like that. And very often, they work very well. <coughs> Without the need to build a whole grammar like, <coughs> like Chomsky would, would, would tell you. So it's like this, this disambiguation rule say, well, if you have this ambiguity, you apply these rules. And if none of the rules apply, there is this default case where you say you get that option by default. It might be wrong. It's like the was the um, conduit dash, right? It could it could have been wrong, but it was good. Okay, so let's let's have the last question. Yeah. Can you either we can talk talk about the alpha? Do you support any um, Slavic reflective languages? Um, we support Russian today, and we support uh, Turkish. And Turkish is different. Is different. I meant like you know, like uh, Czech, Polish. Wait, wait. And is is very for the team of computational linguists that we have is a is a, an, 
was a dream for them working in these languages. And even, even Turkish, where they have these uh, agglutinative structures. I don't know what it means, but it looks like it's complicated. So they, 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 <laughs> they work with that. Or there's this language in Spain called Euskera. It's yeah. like the oldest language in the world, the only language in Europe. And they have this double declination system. So they have words, they have a declination, and the result, they decline it again. And it's a total mess if you try to understand, to learn that language. But it's, again, specifically developed for that, for that language. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, that's our So feel free to talk to us when they're still around. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you guys will join our next uh, meetup. Thanks very much.